Nay, if even in the house of Hades the dead forget their dead, yet will I even there be mindful of my dear comrade. We move about this world trapped and lost in thought images. The idola, rather the dead, haunt our very movements, our emotions and feelings, and our decisions. Perhaps to such a degree that it would be inaccurate to label such things as wholly our own. The dead are the very substance through which we move and partake in being. The dead do not participate in non-being, as demonstrated in Homer's Odyssey, during the Nicaea scene, the dead can be animated or enlivened in order to provide guidance or a prophesying of the future. Odysseus sacrifices a ram and a new to communicate to the dead, and it is through the blood that voice is given to these shades of Hades. They need the life principle of blood in order to speak. In essence, the blood is spirit. It is a vital force that imbues the invisible with voice and substantiality. We can speak at length in another video of the alchemical spirit and its articulation in ancient Egypt and in the works of Empedocles, but for now let us bring back to memory the realization that the dead are not really absent. In fact, they are ever-present, right at this very moment that I am speaking to you. This video is about memory, and through a natural logic, about forgetfulness as well. Like the material cup that holds an immaterial space, these two concepts are embedded within one another. But of course, as with every concept or idea spoken of in this channel, we all know that these are not just abstractions. They are real entities. Mnemosene is the daughter of Kronos and Okeanos and she is known as the mother of the muses. However, while Odysseus looked to the necromantic rites of the Nicaea to speak to the dead in order to receive information regarding the future, the poet, as a prophet, Nemosene, looks to the past, the deep past, ex arche, where time emerges from being. As Jean-Pierre Vernon has noted, quote, to remember, to know, to see, are all considered interchangeable terms. To know and to remember, fundamental to anamnesis, is reliant upon the gods and goddesses revealing knowledge to you, revealing themselves and their symbola and synthemata to you. Remember that knowledge, according to Plato, is a remembering. It is something that your soul already knew prior to the state of amnesia. Therefore, all knowledge is a form of recollection. Opposed to this true knowledge is knowledge of the everyday person, which is called doxa. The everyday person who is led to mistake appearance and opinion for true knowledge. By claiming to know things simply by hearsay or those reported and claimed by others. For the vast majority of humanity, all knowledge functions in the realm of doxa. It is subject to change, because it is like the glittering surface of a pool of water that reflects images and shadows. And men and women who cling on to these images and shadows, thinking they've come at last to the truth, or reality, to Aletheia, are like leaves blown in the wind. The following quote comes from the poet Homer's Iliad, and speaks not only of the ephemerality of the human condition through life and death, but also their being at the mercy of reality as such. Generations of men are like the leaves. In winter, wind blows them down to earth. But then when spring season comes again, the budding wood grows more. And so with men, one generation grows, another dies away. And just like the generations after generations of men and women who've populated this earth, we are at the mercy of the winds of time and fate, blown this way and that, helpless like the leaves in the trees that shiver in the cool breeze of autumn. And if you carefully read the Homeric hymn to Hermes, you will notice line 145 to 147, describing him in the following way, quote, And Hermes, the son of Zeus, 
slip through the keyhole of the dwelling sideways, like autumnal breeze in outer form or airy mist. In the Orphic hymns, we see a dedication to the Chthonic Hermes with his epithet Sikopompos, a carrier of souls or Sikai from one place to another, specifically from the land of the living to the land of the dead. Souls are carried on the wind. This is not poetic fantasy or fanciful imagination. It is the Paracelsian true imaginatio vera. If you disbelieve my words, you are welcome to fall back asleep into the magical and hypnotic power of so-called rationalism and so-called materialism, with its grand theories and systems that dazzle and over time lull the mind to sleep. You see, humans perpetually develop systems and theories of thought and edifices of philosophy and rationality and then tear down those systems in a decade or two only to rebuild along similar lines. We call that progress. Ironically, we love our system building, and yet we hate them just as much and cannot bear the tedium of a rigid, total encompassing system because ultimately the soul rebels. You see, it is not only our concepts and intellectualizing pursuits that make us fall back under the spell of illusion. We ourselves muddy the waters and overcomplicate things with our philosophizing. The ideologies we adopt and hold close to our egos and self-identities distort reality and the understanding of the divine and the secret that move us. Nefarious forces also seek to claim legends and mythic tales for their own ideological ends. Certain aspects of the demonic seek to keep us blinded and ignorant of our divine origins and in order to perpetuate the existing cosmic structure, hold fast anyone who tries to escape from its pathways. Cultural and historical amnesia is a real phenomenon, but it is only the expression of a deeper forgetting that results from a detachment from the origin stories expressed through mythological and theophanic epic poetry. Oral and written traditions have always maintained a thread of continuity between the present and the past, between us here and now and our ancestors. If we forget to preserve these links, our connection with the dead and the divine will be all too final. But all is not so bleak. Everything in nature is presented to us by the muses, and Kingsley speaks eloquently of Empedocles' muse, who at every moment presents us with gifts and invitations to wake up to the world and its living presence. These gifts come in the form of sensations, for if one carefully observes the fleeting realm of phenomena, all things remain still in their flux. The muse of poetry or music or dance or astronomy or tragedy all seek to invite us back into the domain of their mother, the leader of the marching chorus, Nemosene, of memory. With regard to the human condition, we mirror the planetary schema all too closely. The word for planet is plane, which means wandering. Humans are wanderers and therefore cannot attain aletheia in such a state. Aletheia can translate to truth or reality as such. As Parmenides describes in his poem, those who seek what is not, as opposed to what is, are traveling on a route from which no tidings ever come. Anything or person who travels such a route is lost without a trace, never having been heard from. It has gone astray, driven as if by a strong wind. As Moretos explains, like luckless mortals who veer this route stray and wander, the mind in their breast is led astray, plakton. Their wearied limbs are much led astray, their mind is steered by helplessness, they are carried along, deaf, blind, dazed. So they are forced by much inured habit to cast their eye, ear, and tongue on this route, in the hope of reaching something, but their eye remains aimless, a scopo, their ear and tongue only echoes with its own sounds. Rather than leading our own lives, we are led by ineffable and powerful forces, some that help us and others that hinder us along the journey. But the aim of both 
being to confine us to our allotted portion of the great cosmos of divine order. Aymarmene keeps us bound to a prescribed course, just as the heavenly vault obeys the same patterns and configurations, and Elios marks his transit across the sky every day and in the underworld every night to be reborn again. To remember implies that one has forgot, and to recall a past memory within time, in the present moment, is to make something that was arguably absent present in the here and now. But the poet who serves as the true initiate of Mnemosene reveals not the past as a series of instances or moments before the present, since this would only be the case under chronological time. No, the poet evokes primordial time, the deepest origins of reality, where time itself emerged. When you are granted access into the primordial past by Mnemosene, you are being granted a look into the future. This is where the past of prophecy as a future-directed activity is paradoxically attained through an activity of deep memory. Mnemosene grants you access to the dead. Let me say that again. Mnemosene grants you access to the dead. Although not directly recorded, this may be the underlying force that assisted Odysseus in the Nicaea scene. In Carl Gustav Jung's Red Book, under the subheading Scrutinies, he records his conversations with the dead. Quote, Several weeks later, three shades approached me. I noticed from their chilly breath that they were dead. The first figure was that of a woman. She drew near and made a soft whirring sound, the whirring of the wings of the sun beetle. Later on in the dialogue, Jung writes, quote, She moaned and whispered with a weak voice, Give blood. I need blood. So take blood from my heart, I spoke. I thank you, she said. That is fullness of life. The air of the shadow world is thin since we hover on the ocean of the air like birds above the sea. Many went beyond limits, fluttering on indeterminate paths of outer space, bumping at hazard into alien worlds. But we, we who are still near and incomplete, would like to immerse ourselves in the sea of the air and return to Earth, to the living. The aim of memory is to unite the soul with the divine. By building a bridge from the present to the past, Mnemosene is able to heal the wounds of constant genesis in becoming, the perpetuation of reincarnation, and the constant flow of time. She is also able to help the soul break the wheel of generation. She erases the memory of evils, the Lemosene Kakwon. As Vernon remarks, quote, the necessary counterpart to recollection of the past is the forgetting of present time. The other side of Nemosene is Lethe. In fact, the story states how the Oracle of Trophonius was founded. In antiquity, this underground temple was a popular site for incubatory practices. Trophonius, who had become a Chthonic deity, had once been a mortal, who while being chased by his enemies was suddenly swallowed up by the earth. According to Reinberg's work, Where Dreams May Come, if one wanted to consult this oracle, he or she had to undergo purificatory rituals and then be brought to two springs named Lethe and Mnemosene. The initiate drank from Lethe to forget everything about his human life and, like a dead man, entered the realm of night. The second spring enabled him to remember all they had he had seen and heard in the underworld. When he returned, he was no longer restricted to knowledge of the present moment. Contact beyond had revealed both past and future. In a very real sense, because time is cyclical, the seeming discontinuity between the past, present, and future for humans is a part of our fundamental condition, which is that of differentiation. Ultimately, to have both past and future revealed in the present is to have completed the circling and to have truly become whole once again, where the wounds of the vision are healed. 
The two springs in Trophonius's underground tempo echo the contents of the Orphic gold tablets that similarly speak of the two rivers along the path to the other world, of which one should be avoided. It is clear that the river in the plains of Lethe contain the waters of oblivion, which are equivalent to death, and that all the dead who cross over to the realm of night must drink from it to lose both their consciousness and the remembrance of their most recent life. From an immediate perspective, these waters of forgetfulness are merciful. They allow us to forget the pains and the hurts of accumulated suffering in the world. But in the long term, from the perspective of the trajectory of a series of lives, the ultimate deception is that the soul becomes ignorant of any lessons it had learned throughout its previous existences, and is condemned to repeat the cycle of generation over and over again. Albeit in different bodies and different allotments of fate. There are only a few people who are able to retain their memory in the underworld, and one of the most famous examples is Thereseus, the blind prophet of Apollo. As Vernon remarks, quote, memory is a source of immortality. He who retains his memory in Hades transcends the mortal condition. To make this experience of lethe and forgetfulness more real and immediate to the listener, it is only too important for us to note that every time we have absolutely forgotten something or other, even in the most banal details, the waters of Lethe are slowly trickling in. As we get older and enter the twilight years of our life, our cognitive abilities and therefore our memories become impaired through a natural process of gentle forgetting or a more aggressive form as Alzheimer's or dementia. As distressing as these things can be for family members of the loved one, it is reassuring to see the process unfolding as expected. There is a gradual lifting away of the past and the present that was wrapped up with the personality of the individual. Slowly but surely, the soul is sloughing off its mortal frame and re-entering the realm to which we all return. And upon death, the psyche of the traveler drinks their last and decisive cup before completely crossing the threshold. It is interesting to note that many ancient and traditional cultures took a strong interest in the final words spoken by their dying loved ones, having understood that the old and dying are closer to the dead through a blurring of their perceptions, as if in a waking dream state, and can better commune with the land of the spirits more closely and clearly. There are numerous practices spoken of by Empedocles, Pythagoras, and Plato regarding the strengthening and exercise of memory, along with its importance for anamnesis. By the Renaissance, we begin to see Giordano Bruno bringing in memory devices and techniques. After all, the true magus must have a profound memory. The exercise of memory, as highlighted by Pythagoras and Empedocles, is an ascetic discipline, just like fasting or yogic practice. By remaining absolutely still and breathing correctly, finding that fundamental stillness that gives birth to movement, one can stretch one's diaphragm and recall the countless lives we have all lived. Here's an admission from Empedocles himself. Quote, now a wanderer exiled from the divine abode, at other times I have already been a boy and a girl, a bush and a bird, and a dumb fish in the sea. Let us end this video with the 18th century English translator Thomas Taylor and his interpretation of the Orphic hymn to Mnemosene. If you feel like, please burn some frankincense and listen to the poetic words evoking memory. The consort I invoke of Jove divine, source of the holy, sweetly speaking nigh, Free from the oblivion of the fallen mind, by whom the soul with intellect is joined. Reasons increase, and thought to thee belong, all powerful, pleasant, vigilant, and strong. Tis thine to waken from lethargic rest, all thoughts deposited within the breast. And not neglecting, vigorous to excite, the mental eye from dark oblivion's night. Come, blessed power, thy mystic's memory wake.
to holy rites and let his fetters break. Take care for now.